It's a short time. Then nobody's bumping me today. This is it. All those people that are listening, too bad you're not here with us. We got a great little group this morning. I haven't seen a group like this in months. And, and Father, we just give you the glory. And Father, I, I pray as you touched me before I even opened the prayer group this morning, tears were coming down my cheeks because of the agape love that you have for all of us, Father. And I, I pray anyone down the road, brothers, sisters, whoever stumbles that the good Lord above drives you to hear about this little online ministry that's been going on for a long time. And we're real. We do this every day. Been doing it that way for a long time. Nothing's new under the sun. We take up the cross every day and pray for everybody. And it's all about winning souls. It's about the fullness of salvation, not just getting a person saved, but getting them delivered, getting healing going on. I looked at a thing on the news uh, early this morning. My wife said it to me last night. Susan Summers died of breast cancer, 76 years old. Today's her birthday. And, you know, we've, at one point or another in our lives, because TV came in in, what, the 50s, we've seen some of the people especially us older ones, it's our generation right now that's starting to go home to be with the Lord if they're saved. And that's the that's the thing I want the most. You know, that's why I'm excited about being alive and having the opportunity to just acknowledge Jesus Christ publicly or wherever we put our feet. So, I pray that you could see the love of God in the 11 verses I'm going to read right now. And, and recording is on. 19, Second Chronicles, this is the word of God. I pray you got eyes to see, ears to hear. You don't have to read it. You need to hear it and trust it and obey God's word. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And, and we did get a, quite a few little hits on yesterday's teaching already. And it's not even a day old. Because Jehoshaphat is probably one of the better kings. But you're going to see the, the gentle love that God had in this chapter for him. As perfect as he was, as he wanted to do things for the Lord, listen to the word of God closely. Verse 2, and Jehu, the son of Anani, Anani, the seer, in other words, someone that had the prophetic, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, shouldn't, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Question mark. And that really hit me hard this morning because we all get we all get told off sometimes for trying to win souls or trying to explain to people that they need prayer and they need to trust in the Lord with all their heart because we're in that place where that's who our savior is and and we're so excited to be saved that we want to bring the good news to other people so He's questioning Jehoshaphat here. There, let me read that again, that part. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Well, I was that way in the beginning of my Christian walk. I wanted everybody to get saved. And I was upset because a lot of people in Jersey City, when I was lit up like a firecracker, didn't want to hear about Jesus. And I was a 32-year-old guy. That was a fireball because I thought I I found the best thing I ever found. Even though I knew about him when I was a kid, I never knew him. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Verse 3, nevertheless, there are good things found in thee in that thou takest away the groves. In other words, what he did with the Astra idols, the Astra idols when he became king and he started 
putting to work what he had learned and has prepared thine heart. The seer is saying this to him, you know, and Jay, who's telling him, God's prepared your heart and has taken away the groves out of the land and has prepared thine heart. And that's what we all need to be in that place that Jehoshaphat was in. And, and that's why in Hebrews, he says, he rewards those, those. So there's a separation there. You have to diligently seek God. It's like Kenny said when he gave his testimony before. He doesn't worry about anything. He knows who's got his back. I'm the same way. And that's the way everybody in the prayer group, as believers in Jesus Christ, he's got us wrapped up in his arms. And he'll never let go. you got to believe the word of God. And just get up every day. And smile and thank them. Start your day praising God. That's what I've been doing for years. I don't, there's nothing greater than to, to get up and the first thing you do is start thanking God for your breath, thanking him for your salvation. He inhabits the praise of his people. Now, if you really believe that, even if you can't sing, okay, you start singing. Make a melody in your heart. You don't even have to put a song on. You you can actually the melody's already there if you're a worship if you're worshiping God every day. He, I've even sang new songs to God that come out of my heart, telling them how much I love for what He's done for this sinner. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Bathsheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. So basically, he became like an evangelist for the kingdom of God, and he went back to what we are today, how happy are the feet that bring good news. And you focus on being a servant of God. And that's when it gets to be fun, because the more you trust God, the more you walk with God, the more you worship him, the more you acknowledge him, the more you pray, you add the fasting that I preached about, because all disciples are supposed to be fasting. It's not about trying to be a hurdler or a long distance runner people. Your spirit, walking in the spirit as the apostle Paul, the early church, when you study scripture, I'm gonna do some more teaching off the pulpit in the next couple of weeks and with all the scriptures to define why i preach prayer and fasting and why the enemy hates it why because we're we're doing what god wants us all to do and today in the body of christ not everybody is doing what they're supposed to do they might hear the word but they're not doers of the word so he brings them back to the Lord God of their fathers. That doesn't mean their, their biological father right then. That means all their bloodline. Because that's the way the Jews were. And now, something new comes into the picture here. He set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. Those were all the walled and fenced, fortified cities of the Israelites. And he said to the judges, take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man. That's why it's really, really humble that when we're looking at things, we got to be careful on how we're judging people. Because before you can judge someone, you got to look in the mirror at yourself. And I brought that out on the pulpit yesterday. I didn't even know what I was reading because, you know, I've been guilty of it. And you know what? God, God gets you to a place where he humbles each and every one of us sometimes, especially godly sorrow when you're reading the word of God. And you know, right off the top, sometimes you're not giving grace to someone else. You're not doing what Jesus did at the cross. Now, I, can, I can honestly say that about myself, people. I'm confessing that as sin. Even at times in my Christian walk, 
I get upset with people, but I don't go to bed upset. And said to the judges, take heed what you do, for ye judge not for man. So these judges that uh, Jehoshaphat was bringing in for the, the, the cities and everything is almost like, and it's not that way today in the courts. If you can understand, those judges that are on uh, municipal courts and everything, some of these judges are judging according to the party they believe in instead of representing God in being a good or a fair judge. So scripture, when I was reading this this morning, said, take heed what ye do, for ye judge not man, but for the Lord. So the real emphasis on someone being made a judge by the king was they were stepping in and had to really listen. And, and you know, when you go back, I think about Solomon. And Solomon did a lot of bad things. But he did some good things too, and, and and Jehoshaphat was the same way. And 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 it boils down in my heart that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're not perfect, and anyone that thinks they are perfect is wrong, because the the word of God is our illustration, people. So he said, "Who is with you in the judgment?" So when you render something upon someone. And you make your opinion or your thoughts. Sometimes we we speak too soon. I was in a, a, a situation with that, and before I really got crazy about it, I spoke with my wife, and the other person yesterday I spoke to was our brother. Okay, and he's one of our brothers, and he understood why I was upset because sometimes. We do make wrong decisions, but don't get, don't get beat up on it. Just ask God to help you and be more of an observer of things so you can see the fruit that anything can bear. Because God, God has a purpose for everybody. You're going to see it right now. He's no respecter of persons, okay? Sometimes he uses people in the situation because he's God. He used a donkey with Balaam. So here it says, verse 7, because it's God who's with you with the judgment. Go to verse 7. He says, wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. That's referencing God. And you better know what God would do in a situation before you act upon things with your own opinion. Because it says in this verse, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. There's nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. And when I read that this morning, it was like, wow, Lord, thank you for my wife. And thank you for the brother that ministered. Don't think I, I get ministered to, but I pick and choose people with the Lord who might give me the answers I need to hear because under a multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. You don't have to be holier than thou. You just got to be in the word of God. And sometimes we all tend to jump the gun. Moreover, in Jerusalem, did Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priests and the chief fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies, all the arguments. Do you, do you realize how many Christians argue today about every little thing? And that's what was going on thousands of years ago back here. And Jehoshaphat had to put judges to help make the decisions it's not like today remember the 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 israelites he brought them back to worshiping the way god wanted to be worshiped the other tribes started drifting away with all their pagan marriages and everything else and we know the devil uses distractions and people 
to turn our hearts, to steal God's word out of our hearts. And a lot of the rudiments and the things of the world we live in, when you look around today, there's a, a lot of antichrist spirits in everything. And everybody, including word faith, they want to be little gods. That was the thing that drove Lucifer out of heaven. And, and Lucifer is going to use the same ways to deceive Christians. So we got to be very careful on following God's word and becoming, as God teaches us, you begin to grow. We all know the story. First, you get the milk as a baby, and then you got to learn how to chew on the meat and spit out the bones. And, and you know, it's a journey climbing the mountain. Because Mount Zion is where deliverance, healing, and everything else comes into play. And God still, he's still the king, and he's still healing and delivering people today, brothers and sisters. Not everybody has to die of sickness and disease. If there's really God operating through ministries and people, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that's within us can use any one of us at any time. If we're walking and trusting and obeying him and doing the things he tells us, it's nothing for God to show us his glory. And a lot of believers over the years and have written it in books. And there's a lot of people that their testimonies are their testimonies. You can't take away a person's testimony. My sister that I ministered to last night, she's on insulin and everything else. And I witnessed and I told her what my A1C went down to. And she said, you're kidding me. She's known me a long time. I've been diabetic the whole time she knows me. Well, God's doing something in me. And as a brother in Christ, he's doing a lot of things with all of us. Some of the people I know in this prayer group are not the same people I knew four and five years ago. And I'm not the same person because they tell me that. They, they say, Pastor, we see a difference in you right now. But there's a lot of people in the prayer group that come and go. And there's a lot of people, we're all praying for one another. Just because you're not here. I have a shepherd's heart. When people are not here, I get up in the middle of the night and I pray for people. There's some great stuff out there about testimonies of people that get up in the, the middle of the night and pray. God gets the glory. God's the deliverer. He's the healer. And, you know, when, when I read this this morning, God's nor he's, is he a respecter of persons, nor taking of gifts. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the body of Christ, people. So if you're walking with God and you're in the body, God can use any one of us anytime. And as I always tell you, go out there and win souls. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ. Read your Bible and you will you meditate on God's word. You'll find yourself speaking the word of God to strangers. I do it all the time. I don't open a Bible. Living water flows from my heart off of my lips. And you guys know this because you do it too. So we we have to, it takes our witness to bring people into the kingdom of God. That's the faith that God is really pleased with because we're sent out. And today everybody, everybody can claim to be an apostle. Well, all that means is you're sent out. All the disciples, the the first real group, but well, what about the other, the other, the 72, they weren't called apostles, the ones that were in the scripture, they were disciples. Today we're disciples. Sometimes people need a title because of their pride. I always tell people, don't talk about it, just walk it. Let God use each and every one of us for his glory. And here's what he did here at the end, you know, because it's just short read. Why do I go to the commentary? He says, 
Jehoshaphat set the Levites, the priests, the chief elders of Israel. Well, the early disciples went from city to city. They didn't go to college. They didn't go anywhere. Man's changed all this, people. Those guys had the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's why there was a, a boom of miracles going on for the first few hundred years until people came into control churches. There was a period of the dark ages where you don't see nothing going on for God. And you say, brother, why do you say that? I've studied all this. And I share. Anyone that ever comes to my house sees I got an arsenal. And it, it's to the point right now, how many people do you got to tell? And it's because of their unbelief. They're not hungry for God's word. Here, it says here, he put the judges in, he charged them saying, thus shall you do. You judges are going to work with a perfect heart because you fear the Lord. Faithfully, the word faithfully is there. You know, today's world, people are not faithful. Very few. There are some, but we're a minority compared to the majority that's godless, even in America. I tell that to people all the time. We like to boast about being an American, but we're not doing nothing great in this country for Jesus Christ. We're like a, a, a non-believing country right now. Christians argue fight, throw each other in front of the bus, and everybody's always got to be right. There's no humility. And where's the humility come from? You got to imitate Christ. Christ didn't even argue with the people. He came to save them. He had to lay his life down for us to get saved, and he was God. So, I really got shook up when I was reading this this morning, and then it brought me into I could have probably helped my little animal a little better than what I've been doing because, you know, we're dog people. We've had animals the whole time we've been married. And God says, don't worry about it. You know what to do. You know, do what you're supposed to do. You know, God's made us all keepers of the word of God. So verse 10 says, and what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in the cities? So we got to care about everybody, just like I cared about the babies and the innocent Jewish people. There were American people killed. There's all kinds of killing going on over there by a bunch of devils in plain English. Because born again, saved people of God are not going to go out and just ruthlessly kill little babies. And yet, America's killing babies every day. There's no protest, really. A little small handful of Christians wave some signs in front of these Plant Parenthood. I've seen, I've seen it. You know? It's sad what a country that trusts in God is really in the political level, doing all these abominations that God says don't do, America is doing right now. That's even more reason for Christians to start gathering and praying. It should be every week right now, if my people would humble themselves. And I, I don't get that from my own thought. I get convicted when I read the Bible, you know? But people are walking around living life like nothing's happening here. And there's a spiritual thing happening here that the God of this world has blinded the people. Everywhere you go, the devil is being promoted today in our world. Verse 10 says, And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in the cities between what? Blood and blood. And all I thought this morning when I was reading this was the carnage I was seeing on all the news channels in America because of technology. It's pretty disgusting. It's like, it's like, and I said to Sharon, I said, I'm worried about America right now. 
because we got all kinds of people that came in in the last couple of years and all they got to do is become like the Hamas. I looked at New York City. You know, I'm from the New York City area. There's so many tunnels and underground under all those buildings. It would take forever to find all the terrorists if they were in Manhattan. And I thought about what was going on and how all these people, and they're worried about, and people around the world are, protesting they don't want the palestinians but yet there's an enemy and we have an enemy in the spiritual and the churches are clueless you know that's what i got when i was reading this today because this between the blood and the blood let me finish this and then i'll go to commentary between law and commandments, statutes, and judgments, because we got the fullness of God's word today, everybody. So anyone who's reading your Bible, you're accountable. You call yourself a Christian, you're accountable to God to do what the word of God says. Romans doesn't say we have, we can do whatever we want. Paul said, God forbid. Paul didn't go back when he realized he did wrong as a Pharisee killing Christians and imprisoning people that believed in Christ is the one that saved them. Paul was a real deal apostle. He wasn't someone that's walking around like they are today in the world calling themselves apostles. And you don't see the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating today like they were back then, people. Read your Bibles. God will show you things. It'll make you wake up. And in this chapter today, in the 11 verses, I got a wake-up call in, in verse 10. He said, because between the law and the commandment and the statutes and the judgments, ye shall even warn them that they are tres that they're that they trespass not against the Lord. Why? So the wrath will come upon you. That means God's wrath is going to come down upon the disobedience that's going on. This was thousands of years ago, you know, back in the day. And this is scripture. This is God's heart. And he says, so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren, this do, and ye shall not trespass. That, that hit me. I mean, what's wrong with everybody today? It's like the whole world wants to kill everybody. They're threatening all over the planet right now. I've never seen so much stuff pop up in one week as we've seen right now. But it ain't over until God says it's over. So we can enjoy, as I, I say about the Old Testament, it's a great movie. It's a great teaching for God to show us what is going on in everybody's lives. And, and he tells us at the end that deal courageously. So let me read this last verse and then I'm going to hit the, the short commentary and I'll go into the other one. And I want to go to Ezekiel today. And behold, Amariah the chief priest is over you in all matters of the Lord. But we have a high priest, Jesus Christ. He's now over all the body of Christ. That's the New Testament. That's you and I, brothers and sisters. You would think that brothers and sisters would be paying attention closely to the book, especially the time where we're all here, we're all in. It's like Paul said, he was listening, not doing what we were praying all day for Paul, my wife and me. We just said, Lord, help him. He loves you. Put him back in order. And we just, and, and the reason I called him, I said to Ernie the other day, I said, I'm going to call Paul. I got to check up on my brother. There's people out here that, that don't check up on anybody. And that's not love, people. Love, real love is unconditional. And, and it says here, and behold, Amariah, the chief priest, is over all matters of the Lord. And Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for 
all the king's matters. Also the Levites shall be officers before you. And he, in the end of this, it says, deal courageously. And this is being spoken to Jehoshaphat. And the Lord shall be with the good. And that hit me hard this morning. Because sometimes, sometimes myself, I'm, I'm inappropriate when I'm supposed to be good. And that's an area that God showed me I got to work a little harder on. So with all that said, those were the 11 verses. That's my little heart-to-heart -heart spin on what I was reading this morning. And Jehoshaphat returned home safely, okay, because God was gracious with him and protected him through the battle that he, that he was just in. And, you know, when I read the commentaries, I read right into them, and I, I try to understand it. And then, like everybody else, when, you, when other brothers that are putting these commentaries together over the years, this came out of Thomas Nelson this morning. It said, when we are out of the will of God, that's you and I, that's what they're trying to say here in the, the, the teaching. And we get into places of danger because I was looking at all these news reporters yesterday and they had full, they had helmets on, they had full armor on because this isn't the kind of war. I mean, when I was in Vietnam, we had helmets on when we were out on fire bases and everything because mortars and rockets are devastating. It's not a bullet. You can get killed by the shrapnel. Well, it's a lot more sophisticated when you look at the, the recent wars in the Middle East where our soldiers have come out with no limbs, people. I mean, ex-military that I'm oh, man, I, I pray for these people. And these guys are sitting there because of technology, have artificial limbs, legs, and, and, you know, war is not a nice thing. And after what I saw this week in Israel, I'm so, only God can protect Israel. Believe me. The way he protected them in the Old Testament, he's got to be involved in all this right now. When we tempt God, it is as sin to tempt God and force him to work miracles on our behalf. And this was the way, and I'm not going to go there, because this is the way Satan tempted the Lord, Jesus. And it's right there in the, the fourth chapter of Matthew, verses 5, 6, and 7. Here, Jehoshaphat submitted to God's word and went back to ministering after he came out of he, he started putting the spiritual order back in place with the people. While he was fighting someone else's battle, and that's what we're getting involved in around the world, if you don't realize that, I'll remind you that America is sending a lot of money. And we're not over there in the Ukraine. We're, we're taking the taxpayer money, sending it, to do someone else's battle. And it's the same thing with Israel right now. And I was reading this and I was like, wow. You know, same spirits operate as we're reading in the Old Testament. While he was away fighting somebody else's battle, his own people were being neglected. Go to the Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse six. It gets better. Like a good shepherd, he sought, he sought the lost and brought them back to the Lord. And that's where I, I got my Bible. You know, a good shepherd was seeking the Lord. So let me go to what the good shepherd is. Let me see which Bible did I mark it in. I was paying attention this morning because I want you to hear this. Because we don't hear these scriptures all the time. Mine, it was highlighted in my Bible all the way because judgment's going to come on Israel's shepherds. And the word of the Lord 
I'm reading out Ezekiel 34, beginning in chapter 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, and should not the shepherds feed the flocks? That's why you always hear me quote. I quoted it the other day. A lot of rich shepherds with worldly riches in the world today. And they could be doing a lot more than what they're doing. Okay? Because there's a lot of Christians around the world that are starving. Okay? Physically starving for food. And you eat the fat. You clothe yourself with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed, not the flock. And then it gets even better. The disease have you not strengthened. Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled over them. The word of God is very clear here. And they were scattered because they had no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. And the most correct thing God says here in the Old Testament, he says, my sheep wander through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. And none did seek search or seek after them therefore ye shepherds hear the word of the, the lord as i live says the lord god this is god's heart people surely because my flock became afraid my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd neither did my shepherd search for my flock but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock and you can take whatever you want out of this. This is God's word. And this lines up with what I'm reading out of the commentary this morning on the Thomas Nelson. And I'm also reading this out of my Thomas Nelson study Bible. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what God says. Because if the, the shepherd don't feed the flock, God feeds his flock. And he'll take you and I to be shepherds, to go out there and bring the truth to a world that's dying right now. And this is for all Christians, people. Thus said the Lord God, behold, I'm against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore. Listen to what God says here. His last little statement here in verse 10. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth. In other words, they're, they're going to start separating. And that they may not be meat for them anymore. And I, 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 I was reading this stuff this morning as I was putting it together. Because as someone that's trying to feed God's sheep, God forbid I send people down rabbit. You know, I said to a couple of brothers yesterday, I am so taken back by the word of God right now. It's very difficult to be in this kind of a position with people because people today don't want to hear the truth in God's word. Going back to the commentary, the emphasis of the fear of the Lord in verses seven and nine today, Joe. Jehoshaphat had sinned. So as perfect as everybody thinks Jehoshaphat was, he's no different than you and I. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. God forgave him. That's the good news. So don't, don't beat people up. Love them and show them why they're, they have to put their hearts and open up to a Savior. It's God's perfect plan for all of us. You can't save yourself. I know there's a lot of Christians that think you gotta, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. 
Well, that's what the Sadducees and Pharisees were doing. They were being real legalistic, and Jesus Christ, who is God, rebuked them, people. And, and, and it says, but God forgave them. The result of forgiveness should be automatically the fear of the Lord. That's how you know somebody's really born again. They do a, a complete turnaround in their spiritual walk. I'm not the same way I was 37 years ago. I'm much better. And there's more to go, people. People that even know me, that have known me for years, they see it's it's been a progressional change. The more I read the Bible, it's like God. When the more you read this book, he starts to fine-tune us. He gives us memory recall. I can't remember things in the world. But boy, do I remember scripture the last couple of years. I could be talking with people and the living water flows. And you don't get credit for it. It's the Holy Spirit that's in us. He loved us so much. He gave each and every one of us that really, really believed a part of him in our being. And he's going to raise us up. Man, I... Here, true piety consists, it's consistent, in a pure and true zeal. A person that loves God altogether reveres him truly as the Lord, embraces his justice, and treads to offend him more than to die. And, and you know, then I said to myself, okay, I got to get another opinion in here. And that's what I did. Because here, this was 11 verses. Okay. So as Jehoshaphat returns home, he was met by the prophet Jehu with a message from God. Shouldest thou help? The first thing the prophet said, why, why are you out there trying to help the ungodly? That was a good question. It's something that we don't ever talk about in our generation, which has gone lovey-dovey on everything. That's the condition of the churches today, people. God never asked you to love one who is an enemy of God. You know, I like to tell people, you're wasting your time. Pray for them. God's the one that changes the heart and heart. It's one thing to love a sinner. It's another thing to love his sin. That's why there's ungodly soul ties even Christians have with unbelievers. And everybody can jump up and down. And When you study into the Bible and you, you get into this, we need to distinguish between the two. We are to hate the sinner's sin, not agree with. Churches today are letting sinners who are an abomination to God be part of their fellowship. God's word says different people. If a sinner doesn't change, but persists and insists on sticking with their sin, I'll never forget, and I'll quote it to all of you, even my wife, in in Win Worley's books, if a person didn't smoke, stop smoking and repent from smoking, he wouldn't even waste the time to pray with them. And nobody can correct me because I've read the material. Okay? He was following what I'm reading in this commentary. There is no alternatives to God's word. There are people who are actually God's enemies. They are enemies of the word of God. And they are enemies of, guess what? Christianity. Why do you think I bind and loose every day? Because the one world government, the new world order, the one world religion. And, and I, I was talking to a person that knows that this Pope right now is so anti-Christ, he's, he's verbally saying to all the religions, we're going to make a new Bible. 
I mean, that's the kind of life and world we're all living in right now. So praying for people has got to be a priority in everybody's lives. Okay. And, and even Stalin, he, he quoted Stalin. He lived during that time. I didn't really know much about Stalin and except what the, so I move on with the commentaries when I see something like that. But here's the thing. Everyone, even people that have died before us, brothers and sisters, the gospel has been preached for a couple of thousand years. If someone didn't receive Christ, they're not saved. You know, according to the word of God. Stalin had an opportunity to know God, yet he turned into a vowed enemy of God. I do not believe God expected us to pray for him, he says. I don't feel that this is a lovey-dovey hypocrisy of honoring God. And, you know, when I read some of these people, we are, we are commanded in the word of God. I know I am. We're commanded to love one another. That's what God says. That's the second commandment uh, from loving God with all our heart. The second part is, Jesus said, I want you to love one another. God cannot honor a hypocritical position of running around, mouthy, that we're supposed to love everyone. When really, there are only a very few people whom we are to love. We are to love God's people. I said it to this sister last night. I said, you know what you need, Patty? You need to be in fellowship with people that love God. And that'll take away your loneliness. Not taking a pill. Be in the body of Christ. We're to edify and build one another up in Christ Jesus, people. And we are to love the sinner in the sense that we are to try to bring a sinner to Christ. Like I said early on today, I spent 10 years praying for a man. His wife that he's married to right now asked me to marry him. And as her mother said to me, I'll never forget it. How can my daughter marry a Muslim? I preach this. How can two walk together unless they agree? Well, I prayed. I fasted. Three days before the wedding, he came up to me, and we cried, and I hugged him. And his whole family were Muslims. They came to the wedding in their garb. He became a Christian three days before and asked Jesus Christ to save people. So it didn't happen instantly. It took my wife and me, 10 years praying for him, bringing people to his restaurant because he had good food. But what he didn't have, the mother-in-law cried out to me at a table in the restaurant, I can't believe my daughter's marrying a non-believer. And I said, it ain't over until it's over, ma'am. I'm praying for that man. So we got to pray for people. There's another tremendous lesson. God did not send Jehu to Jehoshaphat before he went up to join himself with Ahab and Jezebel. Remember yesterday's, te or not Saturday's teaching? Jehoshaphat, one of the worst kings in the Bible, who was married to a pagan, worshiping Baal. And that's what happened between these two chapters. Jehoshaphat was just a man. He was also a man of God, but he made a mistake. God allowed him to go through the experience with Ahab because God was going to teach him a lesson. Whom God loves, he chastises, brothers and sisters. We all fall short, trust me. And yet God, the author of our salvation 
loves us unconditionally when we say we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we cry out to him to help us. You know, really good read from my heart today when I was looking at that, because God makes it very clear that we're not to judge others. Go back and listen to what I preached yesterday, if you have. Because that came right out of Jesus' mouth. And yet people don't really, they don't really talk about this because the churches are out there judging everybody instead of praying for people. And praying for people is being diligent. You don't pray for a person that's not saved and then forget about them for six months. That's why I always tell people, pray and fast. God makes a way. Remember, he's, he's the author and finisher of our salvation. So what are they, judges, another man's servant to his own master? He standeth and falleth. Yes, to be held up for God's able to make him stand, Romans 14, 4. Some of you that were around me, I opened up my teaching in Romans 8. There is no condemnation in those that love the Lord. We all make mistakes, but he carries us. God is able to make you stand. He's able to give you personal faith in Jesus Christ. That's powerful. God will hold him. I would like you to like this uh, quote that the brother wrote. He says, I must give an account someday for my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my master. And he's talking to the people and he says, and you're not. So we have a defender of our faith and that's Jesus Christ. He is the master. The Lord Jesus Christ is ye, your master, brothers and sisters, and my master. And we're all going to give him an account. The fact that I will someday give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ keeps me plenty busy. And I agree with that statement. That's why I get up every day to serve God, to feed sheep, to just tell people, just trust in Jesus. The, the brother said to me yesterday, I, 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 I titled the message, are you following Jesus? And if you are, or if you're not, the next words I say, turn your eyes to Jesus. Trust Jesus. We all know the word became flesh. So read your Bibles. That's where it all lands. It landed that way for me when I was a baby. I'll never forget what I said to God when I was crying and I was on my knees. God will rebuke anyone that does not the right thing. That's what he did to Jehoshaphat in this chapter today. He taught him through the experience, and Jehoshaphat learned his lesson. What a wonder, wonderful way for me to uh, finish this today. You know, because it's difficult in our legal system today. When a godless man sits on a judge's bench, I know I've been there. He does not feel a responsibility to God. He's a dangerous judge, regardless of who he is. He's a dangerous judge, people, because he is subject to all, all these vices. To begin with, he's apt to make a wrong judgment. Also, he's apt to show respect of persons. And that's why when I hit that, God is no respecter of persons. God only leans on the truth of his word. And that alone is the beginning of who God is. So Jehoshaphat organized everything back in his kingdom after his episode with Ahab and Jezebel. He returned the Jewish people back to worshiping God and not the pagan gods that all the other tribes were doing. And that's that's a pretty good way of landing. And, and when we use, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. That's dynamite. 
to the enemy. Every time we confess our sins, every time we say, I'm sorry, Lord, the enemy loses its grip on us. That's why Jesus said, resist the devil and he will flee. And all we got to do is take that leap of faith all the time when we're being in trouble. I said to that woman that's lonely, I said, I've been your friend for 37 years. Pick up a darn phone and call me. I'm going to answer. And I said, there's a woman's prayer group in our ministries. You need to go in on a Monday night and make some new friends with women that believe. And that then God expands our, our network of knowing believers because we're not supposed to fellowship with darkness people. And that's the problem in marriages and everything else. If you really believe the word of God, how can two walk together unless they agree? Well, that starts even in the marriage. A lot of people get married for the wrong reasons. And God can fix that if we confess our sins and repent. So thank you for listening. This is my explanation of uh, 2 Chronicles 19 this morning. God bless everyone. Hide me now under.
Isaiah 43, verse 1. It says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the deep waters, they will not overwhelm you. You will not drown. And when you go through the fire of oppression, the flames will not consume you. You will not be burned up. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. My friend, there is no storm that is too big that God cannot calm in your life today. Maybe a storm in your business, a storm in your marriage, a storm of disease raging in your body. I want you to hear these words from the Savior tonight. Peace, be still. Peace, be still. And know that I am God. Because when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still and know you. Oh, let down when the oceans rise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Bless everybody. Yay, Team Jesus. Amen. Wow. Have a beautiful time.